good, good. Well, I'm, I'm happy, happy to represent it. So. Absolutely. Uh -huh. He was sitting at our table at the library, so. I hope he's not lost. It's <laughs> nearly impossible to get lost. Well, you know, all your friends. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> no, I was being rhetorical. Well, we're going to get started, although they're still kibitzing out front. Um, I want to say good morning to all of my colleagues and welcome to the SID Laboratory for serious development in thought and implementation. My name is Alonzo Fulgham, and I'm, the CID, I'm a SID board member and the Vice President for Sustainable Development at CH2M Hill, an industry leader in water, low emissions, climate management, environment, and sustainable energy. Before I introduce the moderator, uh, I just want to mention SID Washington's working groups. As many of you know, SID Washington has a number of working groups that focus on topics or regions and, it convenes, and they convene several times a year. If you haven't participated in a Sid Washington working group session, you really must do so, as they are a wonderful exchange of information and bring in terrific speakers. In particular, I want to mention a couple of the work groups that relate to today's topics. We have a work group focused on urban development, which is co-chaired by Jane Katz and Matt Chandy. Are you guys here yet? Come and stand up, let everyone see you. We also have a working group on international health and nutrition and one on the environment. Uh, Shari Bush, co-chair of our environment working group, is also here today. Shari, stand up, let everybody see you. In fact, the environment working group is holding an event on Tuesday, I believe, in conjunction with, the intera with Interaction USAID and the USAID Climate Change Adaptation Plan for 2013. Is that right? So you want to get more people to, to listen to your program, wave to them, let them see you again. <laughs> you can find out more about this activity on the SID website. Uh, colleagues, if you were, in getting to today's discussion, if you were to link SID's working groups to one another, what would they all have in common? Urbanization. Urbanization matters because it takes every development issue and multiplies it by a thousand times. Currently, 50% of humans now live in, cities, in cities and even 50% of refugees now live in cities as well, which makes serving them even harder. In order to ensure that these newly arrived migrants and hopes of a better life are being met, we must be proactive about how these cities are being built. Failing to do so would leave a significant portion of this Earth's living in conditions that threaten their health, safety, security, and economic opportunities. 80% of the global economic activity is concentrated in cities and currently 600 urban centers generate about 60% of global GDP. And these growing, growing cities do not build their transportation and water and electronic infrastructure sustainably. There will be 
severe environmental consequences as well as major economic damage. According to the World Bank, the high concentration of assets and people, especially in coastal areas, is an economic liability with around three trillion in assets at risk from natural hazards. This is just from the natural hazards and not even um, man-made hazards like the recent tragic collapse of a factory in Bangladesh where over a thousand people lost their lives. For people arriving in these cities to have clean drinking water, sturdy workplaces and schools, efficient transportation, nutritious food, we must be proactive about how they are built. It might seem impossible given the pace of the migration, but it's not too late. Some might argue that it will be hard to make the argument to decision makers who will not see the impact for decades to come. But I believe the opposite is true. Evidence shows that building cities right generates near-term benefits while reducing costs associated with the sprawl of congestion, pollution, and climate change. CH2 on Hill is proud to be a global leader in ethically building sustainable water, electric, and transportation systems efficiently and safely. Public-private partnerships will be essential to building sustainable cities, and this is why I believe our panel is especially qualified to discuss the challenges of our rapidly urbanization world. They are thought of as leaders, development practitioners, private sector leaders, and each of their roles is completely essential if we're going to rise to this extremely important challenge before it's too late. I would like to introduce the panel's moderator, Peter Angelique, who is a senior fellow with the Strategic Foresight Initiative at the Atlantic Council, a critical thinker and leader in this subject matter, a moderator, I believe, with impeccable credentials and an understanding of the subject matter. He's a senior fellow, as I mentioned, uh, at the uh, Council of Strategic Foreign Insight, but Peter also has numerous degrees from Georgetown University. Uh, 2011, he received his PhD in history from the Georgetown. While there, he co-authored his second book, Forthcoming of Global Environment and History from 1945 to 2011. I won't go on. We could probably do a whole session just on his background, but I think we're in very good hands. And Peter, I'll turn the panel on to, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Alonzo. Um, yes, I am a, a senior fellow in what we call the Strategic Foresight Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Uh, SFI is uh, focused on long-range global trends, um, and uh, amongst other things, we are focused on the foreign policy and security policy communities. Um, so the question, I think the obvious one, is why would a foreign policy and security policy think tank, uh, of which I am a part, be interested in, in questions of urbanization, and, and the, the sort of the, the blunt, uh, non-diplomatic answer is, well, we're trying to figure that out ourselves. Uh, but the second one, and I think the one that's much more serious, is that um, there is a growing recognition in all quarters that this topic that we're here to talk about today, global urbanization, matters. And it matters in an increasingly wider number of spheres. And, it's, and, and that recognition is growing in, in, a, in a variety of audiences. Um, the way I think, about urbaniz I think about urbanization in a lot of different ways, of course, but one of the, the key sort of um, memes that, that I, I like to use is that cities matter in part because that's where everything happens all at once. In other words, that cities are characterized by, by being dense. That's what dis distinguishes a city from what we might consider to be a non-city. A, a non it's a very simple binary dualism full of fraught with all kinds of analytical problems, but Nonetheless, the key, the key feature of a city is density, density of people, density of activities, density of, in, density of infrastructure, uh, density of structures, and so on and so forth. And that, that, in my opinion, that that density is really the great, the great challenge, because it's an extraordinarily complex, but it's also the great opportunity. It's a great opportunity for us to, um, to work intersectorally, which was the, one of the great themes of this morning's discussion. Um, Speaking of this morning, I was actually perusing the, uh, the high-level panel of eminent persons uh, report that just came out a week ago, and I was scanning it. I, I did not have the time to, uh, to actually read it in depth, but I was scanning it for, for a discussion of cities and urbanization, and there, sprinkled throughout the report, there is reference to, to urbanization in a variety of, of contexts and, and a discussion of cities. And I did find one sentence that was actually quite remarkable to me. On page 17, it said, cities are where the battle for sustainable development will be won or lost. Uh, period. Uh, that's a very bold statement and I think uh, underscores uh, the uh, significance of the topic. Um, 
So what I would like to do today is to uh, have our, our panelists um, go one at a time, give a, a, some brief remarks on, on their thoughts on urbanization, um, and then we'll have a, a discussion, and then uh, I think followed by a Q&A. Um, the first um, is Dr. Rene Holman, who is an urban specialist in the global operations team at the Cities Alliance Secretariat. He oversees a range of global projects in the areas of slum upgrading, strategic urban planning, and national urban policies. Uh, Christine So, to um, uh, Renee's right, is the uh, Vice President of, for International Programs at Plan International USA and is an internationally recognized public health expert with more than two decades specializing in women's and girls' issues in resource-poor settings. Uh, next to her is Farley Cleghorn, who is uh, the Senior Vice President and Chief Technical Officer of Futures Group International, where he is responsible for uh, global health programs. And finally, at the end, is uh, Joseph Donko, who is the Senior Vice President and Managing Director of Urban Programs at CH2M Hill, who has long experience in overseeing urban development programs and strategic master planning for cities and communities around the world. So let me turn to Renee first and ask you, Renee, if, if you wouldn't mind giving uh, the audience a, a, um, a sense of the scale of the phenomenon that we're talking about. and. Um, uh, uh, a, a, a snapshot of, of the scale and the speed of urbanization. Thank you, Peter. I'm happy to do so. So we've heard already some figures on the urbanization, and uh, my problem usually with figures is it's, I, I don't think in figures, but sometimes it can help us to understand really the, the scale and the speed of it, and uh, I've chosen some of those uh, figures that might be understandable, like we have to, until 2013, a million people are added uh, to the urban population per week. And if we think about cities, uh, um, the, this urban population is not necessarily allocated in the mega cities and um, um, mega city regions that we are mostly thinking of. At the moment, already 61% of all urban population lives in cities under a million pe uh, um, people. So I think we talk about a huge increase of small and medium-sized medium cities in the next 20 years. Um, a third of the urban population, as you know, uh, lives in slums, and if we talk about urbanization, we have to be particularly interested in the situation in sub-Saharan Africa. The other numbers or the estimates are at the moment that two-thirds of the urban population um, are considered as slum dwellers. In the next 20 years, cities in sub-Saharan Africa have to accommodate around 300 million new inhabitants. So once again, what does it mean, 300 million new inhabitants? Um, if we think, for example, um, this year, New York City hit a new population mark of uh, uh, 8.3 million people. If we think about the city has its, uh, um, um, uh, um, its roots in the settlements of the 1620s, so it had, had 390 years to develop the services, the transport links, the communities that makes the city as thriving and uh, so attractive. Putting this into context in sub-Saharan Africa, um, 36 cities of the sizes and the functions of New York have to be built in the next 20 years. So it's not only the size, it's also the speed of the urbanization process, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa, that makes urbanization as a key development driver and, uh, um, and unprecedented. We will talk and hear a lot about uh, challenges today, about challenges of service provision, about access to services of, of political voice. But as most of us in this room are socialized in, 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 a, in a country, in countries, in OECD countries that successfully organized, I would like also to shed light a little bit on the benefits of an urbanization. Urbanization transforms the social and economic fabric of an entire society, nation, and a country. Urbanization can modernize societies. It can co-promote accountable governance systems, address gender discrimination, in particular when it comes to land and property rights, very effectively. It can advance new and modern modes of production, and it can, certain studies have uh, estimated, uh, reduce long-term birth rates. But, on the condition that this urbanization is proactively and properly managed. So the um, city leaders, and by that I don't mean um, mayors, I, mean, I also mean health practitioners, urban planners. These city, the decision that we're taking now will impact the cities in the next 20 and 30 years. So this requires a little bit of a mind shift, um, uh, in, uh, a, a, a change in mindset, both in our partner countries, but also in our own institutions where we are located. And I would like to share with you in the next two minutes that mm -hmm. some of the potential 
planning paradigms or governance paradigms that can inform this proactive urbanization management. And I would like to tap on uh, some of our experiences of the Cities Alliance in the field of slum upgrading. Um, first of all, as I've said, urbanization can go hand in hand with human progress and can create inclusive growth. But urbanization must be harnessed in ways that support low income people. Otherwise, we see the proliferation of slums. But what does it mean? I think um, slum dwellers should be, uh, and slums should be seen as an asset and not as a problem, as the potential middle class in waiting, as the potential uh, key assets for economic growth, as those citizens that have a right to essential, uh, as citizens uh, that have the essential right to services as well as economic and social opportunities. And finally for us, also as development partners and not only as beneficiaries down an impact line in our interventions. The second paradigm I think uh, uh, that we believe in and I think that, uh, that also stems from our experience is that um, planning for the future is cheaper than retrofitting. So following that thought that leads us to the fact that long-term planning, city-wide planning strategies, urban strategic planning becomes a key in these processes. And also, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss that afterwards, there are some lessons to be learned how to build these partnerships to survive the next electoral cycle, for example. The third one is also, and I've referred to it, urbanization shouldn't be considered as an urban issue. At least it's my personal understanding. It's a national agenda, and I think we, should, we have to think about ways uh, in which we can go beyond the dichotomy between urban and rural development. For example, by thinking about these small and medium-sized cities, about the role of secondary cities for for, for, farm, for farmers, for markets, for the connectivity of these cities to the essential hubs for international trade. And I think that uh, some research has been done on that to, to inform that. And this is, I think, a very crucial paradigm shift that has to be taking place. The last one. It's, I think, also that a proactive urbanization management in a country um, is not a responsibility of a single tier of government. So it's not to blame local mayors. It's all, not also to, to blame national governments. I think what is needed is here is also uh, a concerted long-term partnership at the national level, for example, in the development of national frameworks for, for planning, the development of scopes for decentralization, uh, development of uh, um, um, funding schemes that can inform and implement it at the local level. At the local level, at the municipal level, I think it's crucial to build up the planning capacities and managing capacities. And finally, at the neighborhood level, to work with these communities um, uh, uh, like slum dweller federations and other uh, civil sector organizations that can inform local policies and the development of these strategic plans. OK. Thank you, Renee. Um, so uh, with this background, uh, Christine, I'd, I'd like to turn to you. And, and uh, you have a, a long um, uh, uh, track record of working in, in issues uh, in the, um, related to women and girls. And how would you see the, um, the challenges as well as the opportunities presented by rapid urbanization in the places that, you're, that you work? Thank you. Um, yes, I think I'm really pleased with what Renee had to say to set this up because those were some of the points that I wanted to make, but I think that we need to take that narrative and then look at how it applies to the populations that are involved, and in particular, women and girls. Um, we have, I think, a popular narrative in international development, which is starting to shift, um, that the idea that you know, if a population becomes urbanized, social indicators automatically go up and everybody's lives improve. And in fact, while that is true to some extent, it's obviously a lot more complex than that. And um, we need to pick it apart to really understand what's going on. In particular, what we see is that if we look at urban social indicators, um, first of all, if you look at it in terms of um, disaggregation by income groups, yes, middle class and upper class do much better in urban areas. Um, but the poor and the ultra poor, in fact, encounter many of the same issues that they have in rural areas, plus they have additional complexities of managing the urban setting and some of the challenges that go along with that. So in fact, we see that um, in a lot of places, indicators, when it, they're broken down like that, 
um, indicate that the poor and the uh, ultra poor are not doing well and may not be doing even as well as they were doing in rural areas. I will just put a caveat to that, that there isn't a whole lot of research around this right now and it's something that we need to be looking at more, especially as it pertains to children, girls, youth. Um, so that said, um, you know, what are some of these issues? The issues continue to be uh, uh, water, sanitation, hygiene. They continue to be nutrition. They continue to be sexual reproductive health, education, access to all of these services. Um, again, I think that um, we think of an urban area perhaps having better access to um, these basic and emergency services. But in fact, what we see is that um, with this rapid growth in urban areas, we have an influx of population where service development cannot keep up. So we don't have the services to match the growing populations. Um, and in addition to that, once people are in the city, they may be in a peri-urban area, they're not necessarily uh, located near the services that they need to access. Um, so how do, how do women and girls fit into this? Well, I mean, obviously we already know about access issues that women and girls um, suffer from and deal with in rural areas. Many of these continue to be the same in terms of prescription about where women and girls can go. But added on to this, with, especially with density issues in um, urban areas, are safety issues. So women and girls, and in particular girls, um, may not feel safe to leave their homes, may not uh, feel safe to go to school, may not feel safe even to go to the latrine that serves their, um, their community because they may be uh, threatened with sexual assault or some other kind of um, threat just because they are out in the open by themselves. Um, so with that, um, we need to look at some of the girl-oriented barriers, that's what um, PLAN is spending quite a bit of time starting to look at right now. Um, and these include lack of um, safety and access to public spaces. So um, are girls comfortable and are girls permitted to go out and operate in these urban areas outside of the confines of their home and close community? Um, the lack of autonomous mobility, how did they get around and do they feel safe getting around? Um, lack of access to quality city services. Can they access these health services? Can they access education? Um, and in particular, a lack of active and meaningful participation. So how do they make their voices heard? Are they ever even asked um, what it is that they're experiencing and how they perceive their own environments and how they would improve those environments were they asked? Um, we were asked when we were putting together this panel to think about what, not just what things look like today, but also what things should look like in the future. And um, PLAN's been doing some research with um, girls and boys in five large urban areas um, across the world. Um, and this included looking at social cartography. So we asked girls and boys, where do they go? Where should they go? And how do they feel when they're trying to go there? Um, in fact, what they came back with was they, um, boys, not surprisingly, when they're going to, for example, when they're going to school, boys tend to say that they feel in general safe going to school, whereas girls in general say that they feel very threatened going to school. We had upwards of 80 and 90 percent of girls saying that they never feel safe when they're going to school. So if we're talking about access, if we're talking about those benefits of being in an urban setting, what does that mean if in fact um, basically the assumptions that we're working off of have really significant flaws. Um, we then asked girls in particular to sit in small groups and draw out what was their vision of an ideal city. Um, and what would it take to change cities and cha to, um, to actually achieve these ideal cities. And what they came back with, you know, frankly, isn't that surprising. But I think, again, it challenges the assumptions of how we're going about urbanization to say we need to be considering those marginalized groups and thinking about what uh, John Podesta was asked this morning about disability. I would say, you know, I'm talking about girls. Let's expand that to groups of disabled and other marginalized groups whose voices are not typically heard. Um, access to emergency services, access to basic services, and this includes the police and the courts. Um, frequently, those are the um, 
you know, point of uh, reference for any sort of challenge to these kinds of um, safety issues that go on. And in fact, what we find are the police and courts are not necessarily sympathetic, they're not necessarily trained, um, they're not necessarily equipped to deal with um, those kinds of issues. Um, not surprisingly, kids come back and they say, we want space to play. We want s space to play safely so that we're not either threatened by um, physical threats like cars and um, construction sites, and we're also not threatened by people who shouldn't be there and who shouldn't be um, threatening us. Um, road infrastructure. Do roads have lights? When I go to school, am I walking along a lit road or am I walking along a dark road? When I go to get water from the public tap, am I safe going to do that or in fact am I threatened because there's no light and somebody could be waiting for me? Um, markets and shopping malls, again, reasonable prices for poor people, reasonable safety. Um, schools, are there schools nearby and are those schools accessible to the poor and the ultra poor? And with schools, I would say that um, access to schools, again, has a lot of the issues that we see in rural areas, um, perhaps not geographic proximity as much, but also the issues about even if we have um, free education for all, that, pe that students and their parents are asked to pay bribes just to be able to attend the schools. Um, transit routes, how do you get from your area into the rest of the city to be able to take advantage of those urban areas? Um, cleanliness and hygiene, um, we know for a fact that when we look at the application of community-led total sanitation approaches, um, which are very successful in rural areas for getting away from open defecation and introducing basic hygiene, in urban areas it's much more difficult to implement that because of um, just physical space. Where do you put the latrines? How many people are using those latrines? Are there, is there safe access? Housing, um, basic institutions like religious institutions, social institutions, all of these things are things that girls um, look at as being part of that ideal city that they would draw and that they would advocate for if anyone were listening. So I'll stop there, um, but let's remember to keep those voices in um, the narrative. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Um, let's turn now to um, Arlie, who uh, is going to talk about uh, uh, public health challenges and opportunities uh, in your area of work. Thank you, thank you. Um, you'll hear some common themes uh, evolving throughout the panel, and, and I think that will form the basis for the conversation after. Uh, Futures Group, uh, by its very name, as you can imagine, we have uh, built our models and reputation on being able to predict what's going to happen in the future and, and trying to help both uh, governments and communities to choose between those futures by understanding the present. And that also applies, of course, uh, in the context of urbanization uh, in low and middle income countries and health. Uh, what you've heard is that uh, a huge proportion of the global population is going to be living in urban areas. Uh, in the next 50 years, and many of them will be living in mega cities, which are huge cities over 10 million in population. And uh, obviously, all of these people can be segmented by some of their basic characteristics. You just heard Christine talk about women and girls. Uh, we heard earlier that two thirds of these people will be poor by whatever definition of poor we choose to use. And uh, this brings up, of course, specific issues around the health of populations, which is, of course, a preoccupation for development. And um, one thing I'd like to point out is that the ecological model of health promotion, which we all use in some form, uh, that is the individual at the center of the community, which is at the center of society. Uh, you know, we use this in development. You know, Coca-Cola uses this to, to sell Coke. Um, this, of course, needs to be readjusted or rethought when we think about mega cities, because what we have is individuals at the center of communities that are overlapping and extremely dense. And uh, the notion of how we apply health approaches to mega cities is, is an art as well as a science. So by any measure, uh, morbidity and mortality, uh, which is, of course is, is how we express the outcomes in health, uh, will be significant in megacities and in urban environments. And as we heard earlier, uh, there are both uh, enablers or advantages to having large conglomerations of people in one place, as well as disablers or disadvantages. And we can try to understand both in order to help to get to better development indices. 
you've heard, for example, that uh, one of the big issues will be uh, water insecurity. This, of course, uh, combines with some of the issues around climate change, both in terms of the available water to be distributed, as well as, and again, we've heard mention of this, the situation of megacities on coasts, which means they will suffer uh, intensified impact from climate change events. So water insecurity, water quality, water potability, sanitation, and waterborne diseases are continue or will continue to be high priority conditions that we have to take into account in the next 50 years. But in addition to water, food as well, food insecurities for large groups of people, uh, energy insecurity, how are they going to cook their food, how are they going to get around, what's the public health, what's the public transportation infrastructure. These are all going to be central to the agenda of how we manage uh, urban areas and cities in the near future. Uh, we talked about, of course, infectious diseases, which tends to go along with uh, waterborne uh, uh, diseases and go along with high concentrations of people because of transmission issues. But there's also an emerging epidemic of non-communicable diseases in the very populations that we are thinking about in these urban centers. And uh, most of you will know that over the next 10 years, the effects of non-communicable diseases will actually not only rival, but will supersede those of infectious diseases in these very populations. And programs to deal with these non-communicable diseases are in their infancy, to say the least. Uh, we, we mentioned environmental degradation and environmental toxicities. Uh, we heard, for example, about the, the collapse of the building in Bangladesh. That's the very tip of the iceberg of, uh, you, you've all heard that the poor pay more. They pay more in every way. They pay more in terms of price. They pay more in terms of outcomes that are negative. And, and the people who died in that building in Bangladesh were poor people who were looking to enhance their livelihood by getting a job. Um, so this is going to be a huge issue, this infrastructural relationship to health and, and outcomes. Um, in, in reference to transportation, how do you move all these people around uh, without killing them all from, from exhaust, from car exhaust? I just want to bring out uh, an example from South America, a current example. Uh, Medellin in Colombia, which most of you think of as a sort of a drug haven, uh, was actually voted last year as the most innovative city in the world because in 10 years they've managed to change their entire transportation infrastructure, reduce their murder rate by 90%, which is an order of magnitude, and also to save themselves from 175 million tons of carbon dioxide. They did all of this by planning. And, and when thinking about what some of the disablers are for urban centers uh, in the developing world, I think someone has mentioned it already, one of the key analytical gaps will be how do they cope with their current circumstances and how do they plan into the future. So one of the development priorities, I think, for this group will be how we help them fill that analytical gap, both in terms of planning for health outcomes as well as planning for co combination outcomes, health and wealth or livelihoods, health and education. How are we going to educate all these young people? The majority of these people are going to be young, and they will need education and jobs. Health and agriculture. How are we going to feed all these people? These are the, the, the integrated solutions that we, from a health perspective, see as part of the solution set for the future, because we can't keep uh, sticking to the silos. Uh, the person at the, the beneficiary at the receiving end of both the planning and development at the locality level, whether it's the mayor of a large city, and from the, the point of view of the donor or development partner, the beneficiary is still the individual in a family, in a community, and the community is part of this large urban center. I also want to point to, uh, from a health standpoint, uh, violence, and Christine mentioned the threat of violence, particularly to young girls, but it's it's way beyond uh, the threat of violence to young girls. It is the ability of urban centers to assure civil security 
when you have large agglomerations of people, many of whom bring some of their tribal and other differences to the city environment. How do we help cities to assure this? This is a massive task. We in this country, of course, have had a growing security industry for the last 50 years, and we find that uh, in many countries that we work in today, the single biggest growth uh, industry is security, being a security guard. And that's something that we have to take into account as we move forward. I just want to mention as well, uh, of course, tobacco. Many of these large urban centers are the single biggest market for the growing tobacco companies in the world. And we have to be able to understand both how that is happening and what is going to be the impact of that. Obviously, it's going to lead to much more cancer, a much more chronic uh, pulmonary disease, which uh, services uh, to deal with these are, in fact, quite underdeveloped. Other potential disablers, because of large uh, agglomerations of poor people, low levels of literacy, and, of course, um, we talked about the, the lack of uh, the fiscal space to innovate from the people who have the responsibility to run these large urban centers. They don't have the money to do it. Medellin in Colombia had a GDP last year of about $11,000. That would be considered a rich country by development standards. Uh, the D DRC, uh, where Kinshasa is, has a GDP of $300 last year. There's a huge fiscal gap there that would prevent the DRC from innovating in the way that Colombia did. Uh, but what are some of the positives? We heard about some of the positives. Obviously, having lots of people in the same place allows you to drive programs that uh, will be able to reach a large part of the population. You know, one of our development uh, principles is do the greatest good. And if you have people together, you can try to drive programs. What are programs? Programs are coherent sets of interventions to deal with health or to deal with combination issues. And you can drive those through high-density uh, urban settings through facilities, which you can't really do in a rural setting. So there are potential advantages that we can use in order to deal with the problems of cities. Um, finally, I'd just like to say that uh, these problems are not just the problems of government. These are the problems of society, and the society includes government, and non-government or non-state. And that means the private sector, both the commercial private sector as well as the non-commercial private sector. And all of these elements are part of the solution for us to think about what the solutions are going to be for uh, mega urban areas over the next 50 years. And we have to have the conversation with everyone present. And finally, um, I'll quote John Podesta from this morning. The lives of the poor are not stovepiped. They, are, they exist in their setting, and we have to be able to bring solutions to that setting that will speak to their current needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farley. Um, and, and finally, last but not least, um, if we could turn to Joseph, who's going to give us a, um, a, a sense of what we need to do to actually create and build the cities. Um, and the infrastructure that, no, this is good. Uh, that we will need uh, in order to um, achieve the best outcomes. Thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to move that to be inclusive um, <laughs> rather than stand up again. Um, it's great to be part of the society's dialogue on urban development. Uh, I want to emphasize three key points today. Uh, embrace sustainable, innovative solutions. Uh, the second is the difference between emerging market and established cities, and then emphasize the importance of local and regional involvement uh, in the planning and implementation of new cities. Um, been a lot of discussion already, so I won't repeat it about the uh, urbanization, but with more people living in the cities and relying on services that they provide, the cities are all competing for natural resources and the amenities to attract businesses. Uh, smart, sustainable cities in these emerging markets are where people want to live because there are economic opportunities there for them and a vision of, of sustained economic growth. Uh, as um, was stated earlier um, by Alonzo first, that 75 percent of economic production is in um, cities and if cities are built safely and sustainably, 
then this urbanization does have the potential to move countries along the development continuum. The challenges we face, um, I will throw out some more figures. Sometimes I work in figures too much. Um, but 3% uh, of the Earth's land surface occupied by cities, but 75% of the resources, energy consumed in cities, two-thirds of the greenhouse gases, um, massive shift occurring on urbanization with the amount of cities that will be more than 4 million people. But accompanying that, uh, in China, um, 20 years from now, 28% uh, of the people will be over 55 years old. 16% of India's population will be um, over 55. So not only is that a major demographic shift, we have to think about the resources that will be needed to support the environment, water, and sustainable energy. We really have limited resources. We only have one planet. We can't create another planet. And it mandates a shift to sustainable urbanization and innovative solutions. The housing and basic needs. Uh, with a billion people in slums today, without the basic services of, of water, shelter, and sanitation, um, we need to think creatively about affordable housing accompanied by access to uh, what I'll call smart um, and practical water, energy, and sanitation. So what do smart cities of the future look like? Uh, we're trying to build cities that promote this, again, sustained economic growth, but are water and sanitation oriented and energy efficient. They're vibrant, accessible communities that attract private sector development. The intent is to create long-term employment for the rapidly growing uh, youth population, which they're desperately in need of jobs, especially over the next five to 10 years. So how do we do this? Um, it starts with smart urban design that is grounded in local culture and diversity. Uh, we need to intentionally build on a city and a location's strengths. Um, we must implement sustainable solutions tailored to the size, size of the city, the location, climate, and resources. Uh, water and wastewater infrastructure is huge. It has a major impact, as my colleagues have said, on the impact of health and the spread of infectious diseases. Um, we were fortunate to be able to work in partnership with many entities in Singapore. And Singapore is, is, uh, is not an emerging city, but the, the issue of urban water can be translated uh, all across the globe. Um, Singapore decided to take a watershed approach to their urban water, and really to focus on um, the local, regional, and national scale implications. Restore first, clean up. Redevelop, again, with economic uh, catalysts, jobs, recreation, tourism, but then, most importantly, education. The, they coined the phrase uh, ABC, um, active, full of life, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, in community bonding and education. In fact, including children throughout the process, um, children develop the educational signage to use for the wetlands treatment. They, they were involved from the get-go. So what happened in, the, in Singapore was a connection of the community to water again, and a place that people could go to. And in many parts of the globe, water is thought about, it's very important in religious and cultural implications. Uh, I'll even use the word sacred. Water is very, very important. So it has function, as we've talked about, but it goes much more than that. Um, we need to create sustainable energy, water, and sanitation solutions that work for households and are enacted by the community. Solutions need to be practical, and they need to be tailored, again, to the size of the community so that they can be owned and maintained by the lo at the local level. It's very important. The next point is energy, water, waste, and food. These are all connected. So we need to map out the resources with the community and ensure that they're part of the solution rather than the problem. Um, for example, every decision we make about energy has a corresponding impact on water and vice versa. So we need to think about these in a systems view. Because of the stigmas in developing countries um, and nations, we should help to eliminate the concept of wastewater. 
all water has the potential for beneficial use and can move along the continuum from wastewater to purified. The, the global water solutions will include conservation, but they'll also include closing the urban water balance. It's very critical. Um, again, all water has beneficial use. We need to implement public, private, and other partnerships that foster an environment of creative yet practical innovation. We have to incorporate an inclusive housing strategy that addresses the entire community. Integrate nature into the urban environment under a practical treatment, uh, uh, practical framework of sustainability. And we need to think about and plan for and implement mobility um, solutions that involve pedestrian, car, auto for people that live there, visit there, and work there. Another real important point is to develop, and we heard about it this morning as well um, from John and others, develop and implement long-term performance management and governance to ensure accountability. We can't do any of this without governance, smart governance, and performance thinking in how we'll measure ourselves. In the cities of the future, we're going to need to use the power of social networking to create sustainable cities. Engage the community through portals and other social networks that share real-time information on how the city's performing, and also soft data, scheduling uh, for learning and social events. And then um, my last point uh, is they're really summarizing if we can implement these guidelines, we really can ensure that cities have the opportunity to become relevant and connected. The goal is to create safe cities um, that are well-managed, and sustainable, not just for this wave of migrants, but for decades to come. We must integrate the historic and cultural fabric to ensure that sense of place in cities. This is what creates community. It, it's really that sense of belonging to something special. And this is what will attract and retain the people and enable the city to thrive. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, I uh, have a couple of follow-on questions. One is actually very specific to uh, Joseph's presentation. Um, and the other one is, uh, I think, very um, uh, general. Um, and the, the first question is, if um, when I think about um, infrastructure and, and cities, uh, going back to the point that I think all of us have emphasized um, already, and, and you, Joseph, emphasized in your last point, I think about the, the sort of silver, silver bullet uh, idea that there are, um, there are investments that can be made that, that um, uh, at the one and the same time address this, these various connections that you laid out, for example, the energy, water, waste, and food nexus. So I was thinking a, a, a good, uh, one example in my mind is green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a phrase that you use or not, but um, or a, a term that you use. Um, but if, if you would, is there a, a very concrete example of the kind of of specific investment um, that would address all of these things simultaneously. So that's question number one, um, very specific one. And the, and the second one would just be to open up the, the discussion to all of the, the panelists and, and ask how <clears throat> your work is informed by these kinds of intersectoral uh, considerations um, in terms of how you go about doing your work. I think um, on the issue of green infrastructure, it, uh, green infrastructure is real because in the right settings, it. Uh, just in the case of water, a shift from gray to green infrastructure can generate revenue streams for a city um, by realizing a reduction in combined sewer overflow, getting back to the point of, of all water has beneficial reuse, so think about it when we're planning cities and designing infrastructure. Um, and by doing that, you can actually save money on operating cities. Another point um, related to the Sorry, I, could we quickly define green infrastructure? What's that? Could we quickly define green infrastructure? Yeah, um, green infrastructure, um, in the case I just mentioned, would be instead of for combined sewer overflow in a city, uh, what we're talking about is putting in uh, means and methods to not allow stormwater to be combined and have to go to expensive treatment. So more green spaces, bioswales. Um, it, it actually, in the net benefit of that is streets become more attractive, places people want to go um, and spend time at. So it's, it, wetlands treatment is green infrastructure. So it's, it's investing in 
technology that requires less energy, less cement, less concrete, less pipelines, less pumps, and using the capacity of nature, in many cases, to do the treatment. The net benefit, though, many times, is this just saves money. This saves money for cities, so that's practical. Sure. An example of the energy-water continuum is in the case of desalination. Those of you who are in the Mideast or work in the Mideast know that all the drinking water and water is provided by desalination. Depending upon what you use for an energy source, if you use fossil fuels versus solar PV, you have a major different impact on the carbon footprint. And you can use solar PV and negate greatly the carbon impact. So there's a direct relationship again between those two. Um, one other point I want to make, which is part of the solution of the, of the practical rural versus a large city, is the concept of bringing what I'll say is the city to the village. And what this is, is to work in partnerships, again, to implement what we'll call um, small-scale renewable energy, water, waste treatment solutions on that level of community. Um, enable employment that would be consistent with that village or small township that is dignified work. Um, again, that embraces their cultural strengths. What this can do is it can, in a small way, help stem the massive dem demographic shift from important rural communities and cultures to cities. Very good, thank you. And, and the second question that I had was, was how, does, um, how is your work informed? How do you go about doing your work given what we've talked about today? Um, we um, sorry, to all the panelists, not just, yeah. I'll let someone else go. I've been speaking too much, yeah. please. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one of the challenges that we're seeing in um, the NGO approach to community development is that um, Plan International, as well as many of our peer organizations, has traditionally had a rural focus. And so we've been working in rural areas for years and years and years, and now um, we some proactively and some less proactively are moving um, into an acknowledgement that we now have to work in urban areas. And I think one of the things is, is that you don't, um, to use the term, throw the baby out with the bathwater. You try and keep um, those lessons learned from the community approaches that we've been using in rural areas and now look and see how they need to be adapted to urban settings. And um, a some of the elements that are true in the way that we work in terms of engaging um, stakeholders and um, duty bearers, be they formal or moral duty bearers, at the community level at the rural, uh, in rural areas, those things are still true in the urban area, but in some cases it's a bit, you throw the pieces up in the air and you have to look at how they land and shift um, once those communities come into an urban setting. Again, because you have communities that don't necessarily have um, the deep roots in terms of the time, the amount of time that they've been in the urban area. It may be a very newly settled uh, peri-urban area, and it may have groups of people coming from different places who don't necessarily have those same kinds of ties as you see in um, rural communities. So still trying to take some of the approaches in terms of really identifying those stakeholders, working with the stakeholders to, to help them or support them in the identification of their own priorities and needs. And then once that's done, working both with the communities and with the more formal infrastructure and authorities um, to try and get the programming and the approaches in place to, to address their issues. Um, and I will just you know, underline what my colleagues have already alluded to, the importance of governance and um, acknowledging governance, and again, I would say both formal governance as well as informal or traditional governance um, within any of the, the solutions that are identified for these issues and really you know, acknowledging and, and addressing how will governance be managed, how will these solutions be managed, um, what, how will the stakeholders have a say in, in the solutions so that they actually can be sustainable um, and that we're not introducing outside ideas and outside approaches that really aren't acceptable to the communities in question. Very good. Farley or? Uh, sure. Um, I'll, I'll use an example of the country of South Africa where, where Futures does a lot of work in health. Um, 
And uh, what we find is that when we sit with the national government to talk about health, uh, one of the issues that repeatedly comes up is how do we deal with health in informal settlements? And the, the, these are slums, obviously, slums and townships. And, and of course, we can advise them about health, but we, we continually run into the issue of everything else. So how do we in combine health and development and economic opportunity and education and infrastructure and environment and energy? And it, the list goes on and on. And you, you realize that what we are facing is the issue of um, I refer to it as the analytical gap uh, in planning for communities that are essentially unplanned, and that is we can't think about it in these silos at all. We have to think in terms of what the totality of the need is. We have to have models that allow for complexity. So if you do interventions today that will have this potential impact, what's going to happen tomorrow and next year and five years from now? And, and that's the analytical gap that, that we as a development community often try to fill, but the way we're currently constructed is in these very specific silos. Right. Renee? So what do we do about it? I think, uh, first of all, Cities Alliance um, has a particular view on that because it's a global partnership consisting of 20 traditional donor countries and NGOs like Slum Dwellers International and Habitat for Humanity. And we did a little bit of homework because we thought, um, yeah, how many cities uh, shall we um, grant a, a city development strategy and how many cities shall we do this? And we came quickly to the conclusion that uh, the scale and the scope of the problem and the intersectoral uh, linkages are as vast that no, not a single agency can just sort out the problems of Nairobi or Kigali by its own. So what we did, we've... Um, piloting uh, the last three years um, so-called country programs in uh, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Mozambique, Vietnam, and Uganda, where we provide a framework as a partnership for collaboration for our members and provide funding to close the gap between them. This can, and this on all, on, all, uh, on, on all, at all levels that I've referred to. So at the national level, we have implementing partners like uh, for example, the German Development Corporation or the World Bank. We have at the local level uh, our slum federa federations working on, on slum upgrading programs and we provide a longer term framework because exactly because the, uh, uh, on, the, on the basis of the assumption that we can't solve that within the next three years, we can't solve it within the next three years, perhaps in an electoral cycle. So what we need is a really shift and, and, and a new form of collaboration between donor countries and aid institutions, as well as between institutions in our partner countries. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, we have about a half an hour, and I'd like to uh, open up the, um, the discussion to the audience. So uh, Q&A, um, I'll just take them, I guess, at right now, one at a time. So yes, this lady in the front, please. If you could um, give your, your affiliate, name and affiliation, please. Mm -hmm. Christine, if we want to improve the safety for women and girls and the perception of safety for women and girls, beyond what I initially heard was, which was improve lighting, especially at water and other sources of vital and hygiene and latrines and pr improve access to police and improve access to courts. What else would you suggest? Because it, it feels like we're at, it feels like we may be at a pivotal moment in history now with so many instances of violence against women and violence against girls receiving international publicity. What would you suggest? Do you want us to answer these one? Yeah. yeah, we'll just go one at a time for now. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for the question. Yeah, and I think that that's very important because I was um, giving examples of some of the logistical and infrastructure 
um, issues around safety. And I think that, to your point, um, there is an increasing dialogue um, and increasing visibility about these issues at the global level and at many national levels. Um, unfortunately, in many cases, this is driven by horrific um, incidents that take place, but then arouse people to actually talk about this. And um, I mean, I think that and I don't mean this to sound glib, but I think part of the answer is really talking about it, keeping it visible, keeping it um, out in front of, of populations, out in front of governance structures and officials. Um, one thing that we are very committed to, and I think, again, we're seeing more and more um, acknowledgement of, is actually getting the voices of those who are involved, I don't want to call them victims, they may be advocates, but, you know, let's get the young people out there talking about how it is that they are affected by this. How does this constrain them? How does this keep them from fulfilling their potential? Um, and I think that there's a role for organizations such as my own to play in helping that happen. Um, you know, I think that um, we're hearing more and more, and, and John Podesta referred to it this morning, in the post-2015 um, agenda about youth unemployment and what are we going to do with all of these youth. Well, part of that is all, one of the benefits of having that in front of us is that that is opening a door for some of the discussions around this. And I think that for gender-based violence, for um, sexual assault, both in non-conflict settings as well as in conflict settings, um, we're seeing more of an open door to be able to keep this as an issue. Um, also, I would just stress that, you know, if we can take a human rights-based approach to our programming and make sure that that is part and parcel of the discussions and the agenda that we are all discussing, again, at global level, at national level, um, that is going to give us a setting for saying we're not just talking about one person being violated. We're talking about basic human rights and, you know, education is not a privilege. Education is a right. Um, being safe is a right and let's make that happen. So it's conceptual, but I think it's very important. Let's go to the gentleman on the on this side of the room, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Edgar Kleinau. I'm working for the Futures Group. And thank you to the panel for uh, highlighting some of the key is issues and challenges we are facing in urbanization. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, something that uh, uh, Joseph ended with. Uh, is the, you, he recommended the use of social media to provide much greater access about the performance of cities. And um, Farley talked about the analytical gap and there are probably many, many reasons for this analytical gap, but one of them, and, and there's a commonality between the two, is um, when we talk about uh, informal settlements or slum populations, I would argue that we have very little information about it. You mentioned some of the indicators, access to water, access to sanitation, access to education. However, um, traditionally when we, for example, do population-based surveys, these uh, informal settlements don't even figure in census tracts, so they don't really get captured in the data that we assess. And uh, so uh, my question to the panel is, how can we improve the situation? I mean, are there some innovative approaches? Is there technology that we can use? And um, so that was my question, and forgive me uh, for shameless advertising. Um, when um, uh, Alonso talked about the working groups of SID, uh, there is one other common element, is monitoring and evaluation. And uh, so SID has actually a working group for that. So stay tuned, I think this would be a very interesting topic, uh, monitoring and evaluation in urban areas, and s especially slum populations. Thank you. Who wants to uh, take a stab at this one? Um, I I'll, I'll just respond to the way that we currently use the social networking portals in existing cities who are revitalizing um, and sharing information, this was a real catalyst. Um, again, um, the example of the tools exist, it's through partnership with um, governments um, and technology providers. Um, the case I one of these started for us was Solar Cities of America, which was just how do you how did San Francisco decide to catalyze the use of solar energy to meet their goal? They had a 2010 goal of 10 megawatts of urban renewable energy. And so what 
we did with a number of partners was create a way to a portal about solar energy, uh, make it all available, completely transparent on who was putting in solar systems, and you as a user could go to that site and you actually could see what your neighbors were doing. Not only that, you could see the contractors that could help you do it. You could get a priced framework for what it would cost in the payback. All transparent, all available. They're at 26, 26 uh, megawatts right now, and they far surpassed their goal. We've got these kind of things going on in, in Washington, D.C. with D.C. Green, Envision Charlotte. Now, these are developed cities, but the concept of sharing information vital sustainability, um, employment, um, and making it available is, is the technology's there, it can work, and it needs to be part of the solution because it will energize the masses to the people in these communities to act. And that's the evidence we have. Now, I didn't answer the data. You asked about how do we get the better data from, say, the favelas or the Mumbai slums, and, and I'm going to let someone else who might be closer to that action answer. Yeah. Sure. Um, very good question. I think this is um, more or less our uh, basis for any slum upgrading project at the moment. Um, there, during the last, I think, five years, there has been a global and very thriving community. It's called Global Land Tool Network that uh, has been working on uh, so-called slum, uh, slum enumeration schemes. So what they did is more or less to develop a free and a public, uh, a free tool that allows slum dwellers by themselves to allocate their plots, to collect household data, and uh, uh, to organize themselves and to inform and to collect the data to inform the planning decision. So that's not only the data. Of course, it's not, it's not uh, something that we would use then on an aggregate basis you know, to form our analysis. But it, it is a political tool that has to be understood as well. A political tool because, as you rightly said, slums are so far uh, a white spot on, on, on many planning, on many development plans at the local level. And something like that, and exactly you referred to it, the use of uh, mobile technology in combination with that, uh, perhaps also included with some GPS data, can be the next step and can be something very practical to be fostered. I'll throw out again the example of Medellin, which uh, I have no vested interest in Medellin. Um, <laughs> but they, they create, they, Medellin is a city that has a core and favelas around on the, on the surrounding hills and separated by deep valleys that ordinarily would have taken two hours to cross to get to the city center. And by putting in transportation infrastructure that actually is elevated, they're actually gondolas, they're cable cars essentially, and trains. Um, they were able to actually photograph every morning the number of people coming out of each favela and come up with population estimates, not for enumeration, but for service planning. Um, I don't know that that's a scalable approach, frankly, but, but it's certainly an innovative approach. And I'll, yes. just, I'll just add, going to some of the more socioeconomic demographic data that we would ideally like, um, I will add the caveat that I haven't been working in, in this area for quite some time, but um, a decade or so ago, I was very involved in developing the uh, methodology for behavioral surveillance surveys, which was really looking at how to get key data around risk behaviors from most at risk populations to HIV and AIDS. And, you know, those were that was specifically an approach that was trying to get to populations who are completely off that grid of census tracts and, you know, the DHS doesn't go there, how do we get to them? And it strikes me that um, hopefully somebody is already working along those lines, and if they aren't, they should be. But there, there are definitely some proven approaches to getting to those kinds of um, populations that aren't, that don't fit in the usual box. Please, ma'am. Thank you all. Uh, first, thanks for a very interesting panel. I'm on the SID Board of Directors. My name is Melissa Logan, and I work with Commonics International as my day job. Um, I found the presentation to be fascinating, and the number of challenges and solutions that you've identified give us all something to think about. My question builds on, um, on Renee's comment is that 
um, that we need to look at ways to build partnerships that withstand the next political or electoral cycle. Also, a number of the solutions that you identified require significant investment that can be sustained over, um, over a period of time. So my question would be thinking about partnerships with an S, as John Podesta described this morning. Um, what are the kinds of partnerships, either working uh, with the formal public sector and or with the private sector that you found throughout your experiences to be ones that are most beneficial and most fruitful in sustaining the kind of investment that's required to um, uh, tackle the challenges that you've identified with, with urbanization? Well, I can tell you that in health, this is a relatively well-developed field of public-private partnerships and private markets in general. And you can segment the population, including populations in, in informal settlements, into those who can pay, those who can't pay, those who need to be subsidized, and those that need free services. And you can actually engage the private sector in order to service those segments. Um, so it, it's well developed, but it's, uh, it's again, uh, governance structures have difficulty getting in front of these issues. Uh, so they, they're very reactive to, in many of the, the countries we work in, the private sector actually supplies m most of the health services, or more than 50%, yet we tend to focus all of our development efforts on the state actors, um, which of course have a role to play in governance and, and for the entire market. Uh, so I think uh, in terms of, of, of markets for health, we, we are coming a long way to understand that uh, you can't just focus on state actors. You need the state actors to allow the market to flourish, but you need private sector partners, many of which are commercial partners, some of which are not. Joseph? Um, I think it's a whole diversity of options here because we've worked in we work with direct private sector um, entities to put in what they, they really want to have as sustainable housing to meet the needs of, of their workforce and do it in a right way that they can attract and retain people. I also really like um, the p concept of public-private other. We've worked extensively. The, the example in Asia of Singapore was the NGOs were fantastic, and I think the NGOs are people we're always working with. Um, as well as universities, uh, labs, um, and then governmental agencies at the local and, um, and, and, and uh, higher level in these countries. So for me, it's, it's all these combinations. And we need to be open-minded about what's going to work at each location. And that's the approach we try to take in all of our work. And, um, and I think that, that willingness to ha embrace others in the process is extremely critical. And I think the solutions at the community and district level are sometimes easy to implement from a governance perspective than much larger problems. And so I think, again, involving the community um, at that informal and formal level um, is pivotal to coming up with a solution that will stick. Okay, very good. Renee, did you have a comment? Yes, uh, I think uh, the question refers to uh, partnerships in, in our partner countries and not the global partnerships that uh, we can also discuss. Um, I think uh, from our experiences from the city development strategy, so strategic urban planning processes that ha don't have an end, that go perhaps five years, ten years, and uh, they have to be reformulated, I think, that, of course, it does depend on the cities and it does depend on the institutional environments, but I think an observation could be that, um, and this is also reflected in our funding, um, that uh, academia becomes more and more important, that uh, academia provides uh, uh, one uh, stable partner in certain mm -hmm. uh, contexts um, to follow up on decisions, to follow up on, a, on, on convening you know, these partnerships with the private sector and with, uh, with the local governments. <coughs> But also, I think um, when it comes to the, uh, mainstreaming and if we want to focus not only on the local level, so how can this be then mainstreamed across the country, uh, approaches like that, uh, I, we shouldn't forget local government associations as, as an organization that, of course, is all, also el has electorates and uh, mayors in it, but the associations as such uh, remain still stable, a stable partner for, for these kind of projects. And I would just add again, um, you know, really looking at the community level, um, 
both local NGOs, local community-based associations, um, and also um, local government officials who may have moved into positions that they're not necessarily trained to occupy. Um, we need to be looking at what kind of actions do we need to be taking to build capacity of those local actors, and I think that should be built into any sort of scheme that we're putting together. We shouldn't assume that um, either the people at the local level have all of the resources and tools and knowledge and know-how um, to do what we're asking them to do, and also we need to acknowledge that having those local associations and organizations that um, can give a, a platform for stakeholders to voice their concerns and their suggestions and their solutions um, also need to be nurtured and, um, and, and provided with those kinds of resources. Yes, please, ma'am. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Patricia DeVecchio with International Purpose. Uh, I first want to thank all of you for uh, all of your information you've provided. Uh, my question is, is that if people are moving to cities in order to improve their livelihood and improve their economic situation, then what do we need to do to actively improve their economic situation? You know, what's the economic development model that's needed? And how do we really empower people to solve their own problems? So eventually, you know, we're out of work. <laughs> it puts us out of work. Any takers on this one? I'll, uh, I'll go ahead. You start. Please. Okay. I'll, I'll just note that one of, I mean, one of the things that we know is that when people move to urban areas, um, they have very tenuous um, stability. They have to find a place to live. They have to get food for their families. Um, both of these are extremely expensive, and they are frequently operating for the first time using a cash economy as opposed to a, an in-kind economy, barter, agriculturally subsistence-based economy. And so um, I'm just thinking even just to personal experiences I've had with urban dwellers in places I've lived in, in, especially in West Africa, you know, they were always on the edge whether or not they could pay the rent at the end of the month, whether or not they could pay the school fees. And so, um, you know, I think that you come to the city, you want to get a job, you may get a job, but um, again, if we want to be um, making that a successful uh, initiative, um, then there needs to be a larger scale vision in terms of how do we provide housing or make sure that housing is available to um, communities and to, to populations that aren't um, necessarily coming with everything they need and aren't necessarily insured of having a job every single day. Um, how do we make sure that food is available? How do we get kids to school when people don't necessarily have the school fees? Um, because those are the things that put people on the edge and, and really can make things fall apart when it doesn't work. I think the key is to get the people that own the process to ask those questions. That's our job if we want to take ourselves out of it. Uh, that often is a challenge. Um, these aren't necessarily the questions that are being asked. Um, I think that each, one of the key points is each area has assets and strengths in its location, whether it's Jeddah or Ahmadabad, places we're working where there's some real strengths in that area for that location in that city to compete and to create jobs. And so I think working with uh, the leaders in that community, formally and informally, to understand how you can develop those strengths to harness and grow their economic um, employment possibilities is critical. Um, harness the DNA of, of the city, because that's their DNA. Um, the other bigger picture on this is the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor. <clears throat> 24 cities, three states, over the next 20 years. The thinking behind that is that these cities will each, crossing three states, will each uh, be developed in a way that harnesses the economic viability and the logistics of that location and connect them all on a, in a very large industrial corridor of flow, of commerce, 
But each of those cities will be smart in the mobility that they design for their workers. They'll have housing for the diverse needs of workers in the entire community spectrum. And they'll be done with resource efficiency in mind. So that's a massive planning effort, but it's that kind of thinking, and it's public-private partnerships is how that will be done in India, is an, I think a key part of the solution. Uh, what's the silver bullet? I think there is none. I, uh, I think what I've learned, or it's my personal <laughs> development paradigm, I usually shut up and listen. <laughs> and this is, I think, and th that was also referred, the research uh, that uh, Christine was referring to is exactly what needs to be done to understand the livelihoods and the diversity of income generation that in, uh, that in slums uh, are already located. Um, just to give you an example of uh, a study that, and, and a project that actually USAID had, had funded in, 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 uh, uh, in Kenya, Nairobi, um, that was uh, on, on the street vendors, uh, that was on those hawkers, uh, they are called, 70% uh, of the population, um, they, are, they sell agricultural products for farmers that don't have an, um, uh, a distribution chain, they sell secondary clothes, uh, second-hand clothes, and all kinds of building materials. I think um, what they, uh, this project led to was uh, um, the creation of a, of a marketplace and the building of a marketplace where social services were also connected to it that provided more services to those street hawkers, more supervision also, but also the first step in formalizing it. That's one way I think that can inspire us. I mean, the other way would be to just, uh, um, um, yeah, to, to criminalize any street vendors. That, that is in certain cities also an, an answer, but I think this was a, one good example how I think uh, an economic development model can be developed locally and can be, and, 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 what the, and the role can be supported by international partners as well. well. One caution I'd like to throw out is that we are all committed to, as I said, that ecological approach, which is the individual, the family, the community, the society. And, but we, we speak in terms of national entities, and national entities today are sometimes powerless to get in front of trends that are international, and we have to be able to understand that a bit better. So for example, just thinking about north of Delhi, where uh, there's been an epidemic of suicides among uh, uh, male weavers of cotton and silk because they've been underpriced by low price products from China. That's something that people don't plan for. Right. But it's a huge issue. We have a little bit more. We have about five minutes left, so I'll take the next two questions. Please, sir. <clears throat> My name is uh, Bill McGreevy. I teach over at Georgetown. I'm a, I, ad I admit that I'm a friend of Farley's also. <laughs> um, Two points, and the first is just two words, Jane Jacobs. I don't hear enough about not intervening too much. Jane Jacobs successfully resisted the building of a freeway through, through uh, Greenwich Village. We ought to be grateful to her. And I'd like to see more awareness that there's a limit to what outsiders should be doing in urban environments. Second point, I hope brief too. Um, we have scarce resources. The people we're dealing with have scarce resources. We should therefore make choices of how to use our time most effectively. Uh, for international donors, for me that means work in the areas where there are public goods and externalities. You work on things that people can't do directly like it or not, people can and must feed themselves to the extent that they can, and we should stay out of that business of their direct nutritional issues. We should be concerned about public health because that is a public good almost entirely. And in fact, many aspects of transport design, water and sanitation, we know what, the, what they are. And the last point is, why not just do those things where the benefits exceed the costs? To do that, you need to find out what are the benefits and costs. And I haven't quite heard that, and finally I admit I'm an economist, but I'm not necessarily a bad person. <laughs> <laughs>
That's okay. the analytical gap, <laughs> knowing what the benefits and costs are. And sir, on, on this microphone. Okay, thanks. Um, Ed Katarakis with Apt Associates. Um, as, as an agronomist and working on rural development issues, I'm a little fresh to the subject of urbanization. However, I've spent a lot of time in India and Africa and I've seen urbanization and feel like it's a freight train coming at us, like an inevitability whether the cities are ready or not. And um, I hear discussions, the statement that retrofitting is a lot more expensive than planning. I hear also that we need jobs. And it's obvious, I mean, this is one thing that jumps off the page at me, is that <clears throat> we can put, we need to overbuild these cities for the future that the cities will be. And there are a lot of urban unemployed youth. Um, can we put that together? And we talk about partnerships and a lot of people being at the table, but I just wanted to know, given the scale, and especially when we talk about second cities around the world that don't get the attention of the national governments, um, <clears throat> is there enough money there? And if so, where is it coming from? And uh, let's go to the final uh, question from Alonzo. I'll go ahead and answer those and I'll go with the final Okay, part. very good. Um, and no, if, Whomever wants to address either or both of those, those I th points. I think the question of is there enough money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it behooves us all to think in terms of what are the interventions that we can su support sustainably. Countries need to be able to, un to answer that question as they plan. And uh, the answer to the question, is there enough money, is, is no, there isn't. And, and, but that's only one of the constraints. And so we need to understand the constraints. We need to understand what the, the enablers are. Um, there is no easy answer, and that's why we're here, unfortunately. Um, and my opinion, the, uh, it's, it's imperative that all of us share the rapid deployment of success stories and best practices and continue to break down any barriers that we have in our own organizations and that we see in front of us. And we, and we, it's a scale problem that's huge, but on a day-to-day -day basis, doing what we can and where it works, getting that out there to rapidly um, infect other good place, other places with solutions. And that's something we all can do better every day, um, but to keep it tangible, we can find solutions and we are finding solutions to these problems we're talking about. Um, but it's all about continuing to share. And there'll be six billion mobile phones in, by 2015. Everybody will have a mobile phone. So again, we can harness that in a positive way. Is there enough money? I think that, uh, that uh, was also already answered. But I think we shouldn't forget about the va land values that uh, will be created in these cities. And the land values are actually the driver. And I think some private, uh, private companies, they already see the opportunity and all, all already have taken advantage of that. I mean, if we think about uh, the uh, commercial housing sector, for example, in some of those country, uh, some of those cities. So there is, there is a value. There is an increasing value. But the, I think the governance question here is, again, how are these values used and who's benefiting from it? Uh, and uh, to what extent can we achieve some of our public goods that we want to, like uh, uh, decent affordable housing in, in, in most of the cities? And staying at that housing uh, question, for example, we don't have the money because we can't, there is not one institution. So the partnerships has to be created, but it has also to be um, covered and mostly financed through the communities by, them, by themselves. If we look at, for example, experiences in South Africa on, on their housing and cycles, and, uh, and I think for the last 40 years, um, they came now to the conclusion that they can't actually pay for that public housing. So the, um, there need to be models in place that can incrementally grow, that are adaptable to uh, the socioeconomic conditions of those beneficiaries. So they can grow over time, but it's not a one set solution that can be built and will last for the next 40 years. And I'll just say I was pleased to hear you mention second cities because mm -hmm. I, I think that um, we need to be thinking about, you know, we've got capital cities and very large, already well-established cities, but we also have secondary cities and those cities can really end up um, being 
I, I don't know if it's overflow or just the, the target of reallocation of where those people are moving into. And a key thing to that is that in those um, you know, national level planning visions, thinking about what kind of infrastructure can be located in those second cities to make them attractive. So rather than having a university that's only located in the capital city, do you then plan for annexes of the university in secondary cities, which then will provide a draw and I think allow maybe some space for getting out in front of the planning that needs to get that needs to take place to put infrastructure in place and services in place as the population comes rather than doing that retrofitting after the population is already there. I'm going to Alonso, I'm going to delay that final question because it is 12 o'clock and I know folks want to move on but first of all I want to thank the panel I think for an enriching conversation but also the way that they stitched together all of the issues. And what I hope you leave from here today thinking about is how we're going to better inform the community on how to design better projects and programs going forward that are much more integrated. And I think Farley laid it out quite well. We continue to stay in the stovepipes. We've got to figure out how to design programs that really are going to affect, affect this urbanization process going forward. Right now, urbanization seems like a program that's kind of, oh, that's that urbanization stuff. But as I mentioned in my opening, it's the piece that integrates everything that we're doing. And if we don't find a way to affect that, all the great work that we're doing is going to be for not over the next five to ten years. We just look at some of the capitals uh, in Africa and Asia that really are going to be affected by this. So I think as professionals, and I meant that when I opened up today, about it being a laboratory uh, for, for innovation and, and, and implementation. Because without you as the professionals, really addressing these issues and pushing the international financial institutions, the donors, and the private sectors and the countries that you're working in, it's going to redouble the work that's going to need to be done. And I think all of you recognize that the donor dollars are going to continue, or from the ODA perspective, continue to be flat uh, over the years. And more and more in capitals, not just here in the United States, but throughout the world, they're asking, what are we getting for our dollars? So we have to be smarter. Uh, we have to implement better and design better. So I hope that from this session, I, I really appreciate all the participation, but really the thanks should go to this wonderful panel. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Peter, you have the last word. Uh, thank you all for coming and for your interest in this topic, and thank you to the uh, panelists. I, I enjoyed our very rich discussion. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Wonderful. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Good.